Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast, where we talk about everything dog. Q and A's with veterinarian professionals, rescue operators, everyday topics. We cover everything dog on this podcast. So make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform, and make sure you're following us on social media on both Instagram and Facebook. Thanks again for listening. Now here's that next episode. Hey everyone, welcome to the Canine Culture Podcast. This is your host, Brittany, and today we are joined by Dr. Pete. He is the founder of Voyager Dog Food Company. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Pete. Hello there. Nice to see you. So you have a very interesting background, makes you perfect for this job. So tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you started Voyager Dog Food Company. Okay. Uh, well, I've been practicing veterinary medicine for about 49 years. and uh, in the course of, you know, that period of time, you learn a lot of things and you learn a lot of things. You kind of reinvent yourself and do a few things. If we'd had this conversation 10 years ago that I was going to make dog food, I would have probably suggested that you should get drug tested, but <laughs> you know, things kind of end the way they do. And so we had the, we had one of our dogs, one, actually my son's dog died of uh, copper storage. And, um, and there's a, there was a reason for it. It was a man-made problem. So usually when you have a man-made problem, you figure that, um, you know, you can get those repaired because they're man-made. And, and this was one of those things where nobody was going to fix this. And so I decided that um, even I, even though I was a little on the older side, that I was going to go ahead and start my own dog food company. And I'd, I would at least make a dog food that didn't have uh, copper sulfate or proteinaceous copper in it for our own family mm-hmm. um, and actually our friends and my clients. And so the people around here in, in the town in which I live would have the option uh, feeding something with or without copper. And that's why I did it. Um, I talked about this a little bit one time that, you know, I got up every morning, you know, thinking about it, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, I wake up thinking, you know, somebody's got to do this. Somebody should do something about this. And and then, well, this is stupid. You know, I'm getting up at 4.30 in the morning and thinking about stuff and my mind's just... Right. And so I just decided to do this. And then now I sleep until 6.30, quarter to 7. So. <laughs> right. And, and, I'm, and, I, and I go to work and I feel better because I'm not you know, tortured by this whole thing. Yeah. And the copper storage. So we're going to get into that because that I think is one of the biggest topics that we can cover on this episode. But a couple of things that I noted from your website. So number one, food is medicine. And I preach food is medicine for humans and for dogs. And it's kind of crazy that it still hasn't caught on for either for humans or for dogs. You know, we've still got people out here eating their little Debbie cakes with every meal and having seven or eight sodas a day. And then with dogs, we've got people buying, I won't say any brands, but they're buying the cheapest of the cheap, the lowest of the low food that it shouldn't be fed to any animal, let alone our dogs. And so food is medicine. That's huge. And then the second thing I noted from your website was treat the treatable and prevent the preventable. And I think that speaks magnitude to medicine in general, Um, but especially pet medicine. You know, I think a lot of times with treating our dogs, we might do a few preventative things, but ultimately what we seem to be doing is reacting. And so a lot of dog owners are reacting to, well, Fluffy's had a really upset stomach. Fluffy's had diarrhea blah, 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 blah. Turns out Fluffy's shown issues for a couple of years. We just didn't recognize those. And now here we are reacting to those. So uh, I love that part of your website and the fact that you were trying to do things correctly. Um, So that's great. So talk a little bit about using food as medicine or your viewpoint on using food perhaps as a preventative, because a lot of people think of a preventative as you know, maybe a flea medication, maybe a heartworm preventative. So let's talk a little bit about how food can serve in that same magnitude. Yeah, well, let me start by saying this, I think as a veterinarian, um, and I didn't know this to begin with when I got out of school, but I think that what we sell as veterinarians is information and peace of mind. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I think there's all these conversations that need to go on. And and part of my job is to kind of explain the risk and the reward, the risk and the reward. And sometimes there's risk out there that the clients think they're willing to take because they don't think the risk is very high. And and that's that's the art form of this of veterinary practice is going ahead and explaining that all to them. And mm-hmm. uh, so I, I see this all the time 
the risk, the reward, the risk, the reward. And, and, um, and so for really for an awful long time now, I've had people say, well, what's the best dog food? What's the best dog food? And, and quite frankly, almost everything had warts. Uh, that's why I refer to it as warts. And uh, there was, you know, they had the grain free thing. I was not a big fan of. Um, we do an awful lot of uh, drug trials at our at our veterinary hospital. In other words, uh, somebody wants to get a new medicine on the market, and so they would come to us, and we would uh, do a, a study. And, um, and so that, those are always kind of fun because you learn a lot of things. You learn a lot of things because they make you do it in a different way than what you would normally do it. Mm-hmm. And this is kind of where this all came to light that. The things weren't just right, and uh, we we also have another little motto. It's it's very nice if your dog likes our food, but it's a hell of a lot nice a hell of a lot nicer if our food likes your dog. <laughs> right. That goes for cat food. If you're feeding it and they do well, great. Uh, but mm-hmm. if you're having a problem, uh, then you got to go ahead and figure out what those are. So I would I would start by telling you that yes, uh, we had a family dog that died of of copper storage disease, and that's a man made problem. It, it's a situation where um, a long time ago, 30, 40 years ago, somebody started putting copper sulfate in pig food because pigs grew in a more efficient manner and, and went to market sooner. And the, and the pork farmers made more money if they put copper sulfate in the food. Well, the problem with that whole thing is that a pig is deceased or, or, or used for meat by the time they're six or seven months. Our dogs, however, we would like them to live 14, 15, 17, 18, whatever we can get out of them, mm-hmm. the years we can get out of them. So what happened in the canine population is you put all this copper into these dogs and a lot of it would go through and get metabolized and leave. But some of it would get stored in the liver and, and you'd start to reach a, a point in which there was so much copper in that liver that the liver would become unhappy about it. And then you start to be, get inflammation and you'd eventually get cirrhosis and death. And uh, that's kind of what happens. The big problem in our business is uh, I don't have any uh, I don't have any patients that bitch about anything. In other words, they don't walk in and go, geez, I've got this blurring headache today or right. I'm upset all the time or I seem like I'm kind of gassier and I ought to be blah, 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 blah. So I don't get any. Uh, we like to think we have a unique practice, but we don't have any talking dogs or talking cats or talking <laughs> anything. And so, yeah, so we have to be able to kind of figure this all out. And uh, and so that's what we we kind of figured out. We kind of known this was going on for a while, and then we had the death of a family pet. Mm-hmm. And, and then since it was a man made problem, you think, well, all you got to do is let everybody know there's a problem, and 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 it may be men or maybe women, but somebody, a man. Uh, a human being will fix the problem you have. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's, there didn't seem to be any urgency on anybody to do anything about this. And uh, I found that incredible. We were doing all these things to try to make our animals healthier, live longer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it wasn't just the copper. I mean, there were other things, uh, the grain free thing, food allergies, all that sort of, all that sort of thing. And, uh, so I would look at all these things and I wonder why they have five different proteins in a food. Because in my opinion, you got to have one protein. Mm-hmm. There could be some protein and maybe some of the grains in there, but it's either going to be a chicken-based diet or it'd be a pork-based diet or it'd be a turkey-based diet or something like that. It shouldn't have the uh, dog food shouldn't look like the old country buffet with you know nine pieces <laughs> of everything. Or, right. And so, um, what was the what was the purpose of adding copper to food? Is it does it serve as a, a a protein substitute in that it's cost efficient or or how did we even start adding cuz it makes sense for pigs if we're raising pigs to uh harvest for meat maybe you want to make them get fatter faster you don't care about the longevity but how did this end up in our dog food well it was a growth promote, promote for pigs so you have to remember you got this little pig that's born as a day old the little Labrador retriever that's born is a day old. They're about the same size. The pig's a little bigger. But within, you know, the pig gets to 250 pounds in six or seven months. It takes forever for the, well, the dog don't, never does get to 220. But it, at, uh, at the same age of seven months or somewhere thereabouts, that Labrador retriever is 45 pounds, 47 pounds, 48 pounds, something like that. The pig's 240, 250, 260. So it's obvious their needs are different. So, so what they decided was, since it really works so well for pigs, we just put it in um, uh, cattle food, and then we'd put it in chicken food, we put okay. it in food, even put it in fish food. In fact, uh, we were doing some work on, you know, 
trying to figure out what proteins we wanted to use. And we had some pond raised fish and, and they were putting copper sulfate in the pond to, to clear the algae. Right. And then they were putting copper sulfate in the pig food or in the, excuse me, in the fish food. And then they were putting pork meal in the fish food and the pork had eaten copper sulfate before it went right. in. So you had three sources. And so, you know, something that should have had seven or eight or nine, 10 parts per million of copper had 129.5 parts per million of, of copper. So we can't use pond raised fish for our dog food because there's too much copper. Mm hmm. And uh, we don't see this problem with cats, but we do see it with dogs. And it's really much more prevalent than we, than most anybody would guess. And I was going to ask kind of on that, the prevalence of it. Are there any regulations at this point that dog food companies have to test for copper to be below X number? Do, does it have to be within range for it to hit the market? So it has to be a minimum of 7.3 parts per million. So my foods have 7.4, 7.6, 8, something like that. But you can go all the way up to three or four or five or 600 parts per million and nobody says anything. So that's a big mistake. Okay. So we've kind of got a floor, but we don't have a ceiling yet. Right. Well, there was a ceiling at 250 and then they took that off. You know, I mean, a dog food manufacturer would have to be completely insane, although there might be a few of them around, but to put... 250 to 300 parts per million of copper in a dog food. Um, right. So, and, and they do it. And it, it's a, it's, it comes in a bag and it's part of a premix. You know, they like put, they put kind of think of this as like Tide Pods in, in the dog food that had the vitamins and minerals in it. And it always yeah. contains copper sulfate or proteinaceous copper. Hmm. It used to be cupuric oxide. And then they said, well, that's not bioavailable enough. We need it really bioavailable. Mm -hmm. And so, and we never had very many problems when we put cupuric oxide in um, as copper and, and uh, O2, Cu, O2. And uh, but now we use CuSO4, which is copper sulfate. Mm -hmm. and so that's what we're putting in foods right now. And it's, it's uh, really a problem. Um, it, it's not easy to diagnose. By the way, people get it. It's called Wilson's disease in people. Okay. And have you ever heard of Wilson's disease? At I all? haven't. No. Yeah. It's, but with people, it's genetic. With dogs, it doesn't. There's some genetic components to it: Labradors, Dobermans, Dalmatians, um, Westies. They all tend to get it a little more than other dogs. But the last couple I've had were Chihuahuas. So, oh, okay. So, so, and I know you mentioned earlier the effects on the liver. So, it would seem that if you were doing blood work and perhaps your dog's liver enzymes were elevated constantly maybe that would be a red flag. Not, not that you're always checking for that. And we're always looking at a thousand other things when their liver enzymes are elevated, but are there any other symptoms, maybe even just to the general eye without going into your vet and before you do this lab work, any kind of indication, Hey, my dog might have too much copper. Or they're on the verge of a, a copper overdose. Well, that's what we talk about. The good things about dogs is they're tough. And the bad things about dogs is they're tough. Mm -hmm. Just like we talked about earlier, they don't complain about anything. So when you get an elevated liver enzyme, uh, the only way to really diagnose what's wrong with your dog's liver, you can run the test till the cows come home. But the only way to figure this out is to biopsy the liver to see. And and that requires either a laparoscope or some, some of ours we do surgically, just making mm -hmm. an incision, take a little piece of liver. Veterinarians don't like having that done. Dogs don't like having that done. Clients don't like having it done. And the, and the big problem is the laparoscopic. Uh, laparoscopic jobs are about three to four or five grand. Mm -hmm. so a lot of people can't afford to have that done. So there's an art form in diagnosing this. So usually what you do is you kind of go through the things you would normally use the quote unquote cop uh, on the, excuse me, the liver drugs. Um, liver drugs would be SAMI, milk thistle, ursodiol, sometimes steroids, sometimes antibiotics, things of that nature. So then then you recheck and see if it came down. If it didn't come down, then you have to do something. And uh, and so now people are starting to sometimes uh, give these chelating agents. A typical case would be you do the biopsy, you figure out they got copper storage, mm -hmm. then you get a chelating agent, which actually attaches itself to the copper and issues it out of the body. Mm -hmm. There's a chelating agent called dependacillamine. And you usually give a dog that for two, three months, sometimes longer, and then that clears all the copper out of the liver. You put the dog on a restricted copper diet, a restricted copper diet, and then you see 
uh, what happens? Usually they don't go back to where they were because now you've removed the thing that was causing all the problems in the first place, which was the copper sulfate and the proteinaceous copper. When you look right. at these bags of food, they all have this on the back of them. And uh, people are watching this right now and they're going, are you sure it's on there? Yes, I'm sure. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we sell about the only food in America today that doesn't have copper added to it. So um, there's a couple of prescription diets, uh, one by Royal Canaan and one by Science Diet. But we carry the only over-the-counter, and we refer to it as a prophylactic diet. In other words, it prevents copper storage disease. And that's what we mm -hmm. do. We've got a patent on it. And uh, so this isn't – I've thought about this for a long time, and I've been working on this for a long time. So I've tried to, um, you know, n <laughs> you know, not, not dot the T's and cross the I's. I'm trying to do it the way I should do it. but. Uh, mm -hmm. dot the I's and cross the T's, get it all done, make sure everything's the way it ought to be. And we've been making this food now for about five years. And, and I uh, I can tell you, it's very, very gratifying because, uh, oh, geez, I mean, we sell this all over the United States and people have been sending me uh, craft beers in the mail and <laughs> and uh, caramel corn and restaurant uh, gift cards and all sorts of stuff. And people, and, and that's really gratifying because they'll say, you know, you changed our, you changed our family's life because you changed our dog's life. And, uh, and that's, that's really, um, you can't put a price on that. Right. That. Yep. What kind of differences are people seeing when they switch from your traditional over-the-counter food to the Voyager dog food? What kind of stories have you heard? Well, if they've had copper, if they've had copper uh, storage or suspected they had, it's called it's um, copper associated hepatopathy or chronic active hepatitis. But mm -hmm. we think a lot of these chronic active hepatitises or inflammation of the liver are really copper associated hepatopathies. And so, what you'll see is uh, the clients, uh, you know, they, their veterinarian puts them on all the quote unquote liver drugs, and then nothing gets better. And some of them have kind of figured this out on their own that they'll get online and they'll look around and they'll run into our story. And then they'll order a couple of bags and they're like, well, I didn't know as much to begin with. But after a month, things started to look up. We rechecked our liver enzymes and they were just down a little bit. And then we checked them another 30 days later and they were really down. And uh, so what happens is if you don't put, you know, if you don't put any gas in your car, eventually you run out of gas. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're trying to do when you do this. We're trying mm -hmm. to run out of copper. And um, so it's very, very gratifying. And uh, and and people are like, you know, the, the big problem I have is when these clients figure this out for themselves. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not, I, I, my, my veterinarian would probably be mad if he knew I did this all by myself. I said, I don't care. Go tell him. <laughs> Go tell her. Go tell him. I don't care. You know, that's, I learn from clients. Clients learn from uh, their veterinarians. It should be. That thing should go both ways. I could learn something from you. You could learn something from me. That's what right. should be. Right. That, having that reciprocity. But a lot of vets don't like that. They're like, no, no, no. I haven't studied that. You can't do that. So um, I've kind of faced that issue before. Well, go find another vet. I mean, really, uh, mm -hmm. egos are a terrible thing in a profession. And uh, and, and you, you have your own profession. And so I'm sure you're aware of that, that <laughs> yeah. everybody would just check their egos at the door. This would be a lot nicer place to live. Absolutely. Uh, and and it, it makes you feel bad sometimes if you miss something, but it, you know it's it's uh, it kind of gets you right here a little bit, and then you don't miss it again. And you, right. you stand up here and say, "I'm not going to do that again." Yeah. And, and I know your food uh, can be beneficial for dogs with allergies, and I do think we have seen so many dogs allergic to. In what I have heard, kind of feedback is my dog's allergic to chicken. My dog's allergic to beef. My dog's allergic to pork. And one of the questions I kind of had was, is your dog allergic to that? Are they allergic to the production of it or the quality of it? And so let's talk a little bit. Let's pivot to kind of allergies. You and I talked a little bit off air about it and maybe the rise in allergies or some of the common allergens that we're seeing. Well, you can be allergic to three things, and I'll tell you what they are. They are fleas or the flea um, saliva, mm -hmm. uh, environmental things, uh, in other words, pollen, uh, house dust, uh, dust mites, you know, all that sort of thing. And then you can be allergic to foods. So foods, and, and these kind of go in a progression. So you, typically, uh, do you have children at all or not? No, just for okay. Pomeranians. Okay, so <laughs> If you had children and you were taking your kids to kindergarten, the day you get there on the first day, they'll tell you, you can't bring this, you can't bring that, because 
two of the pediatricians in town had figured out two of the children in this class were allergic to things. Mm -hmm. That's the way it happens with dogs. They'll start as early as 12, 13 weeks of age developing uh, allergies, sometimes to food. And that window usually closes around 13, 14 months. And most of those dogs will, will show up with ear infections or chronic hot spots, these mm -hmm. real, these, uh, those things. So if, if I had a, when I go and see, I walk in a room, I see a dog with ear infections. The first thing I talk to him about is that this, my guess is this is food allergy. And if I take a decent history, they'll say, yeah, you know, it's been kind of off and on since he was about five or six months of age. He's had, he's digging his ears and he's doing this and doing that. And, and uh, so then we have this conversation about what do I think your dog's allergic to? Now we do these clinical trials in our office uh, with food allergies. Um, well, mostly we're, we're trying to see how efficacious an ear medication is to treat an ear. And most mm -hmm. of ear medications have steroids in them. So what we'll do is when we are doing those studies, uh, you know, we can't change their food during the course of the study. It's usually a 30 day thing. Mm -hmm. but at the end of 30 days, man, I get to tell them, okay, you told me day one you were given milk bones, but I couldn't tell you not to give them anymore, but I don't want you to give milk bones because the three, in my, in my estimation, the three most common causes of, of food allergies are beef, milk, and wheat. Mm -hmm. and beef, milk, and wheat. And I, I have people remember that by saying, okay, what's your favorite German car? And they're like, Audi? No, no, no. BMW. No beef, no milk, no wheat. No <laughs> milk, no wheat. What other letters do they have to remember? HOH. What does that stand for? Water. Nobody's allergic to water. Absolutely nobody. But I, I tell people that's all I want your dog to drink. I don't want them drinking uh, uh, the milk out of your cereal bowl or anything like that. So I want you to avoid uh, anything liquid going in your dog's mouth other than water. Mm -hmm. That drops me down to the treats. And I tell you that the treats are more responsible for the food allergies than the food is. Hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'll go into a room and I'll say, well, uh, does your dog like this? No, he doesn't like that. Does he like that? Oh, he likes that really well. I could go down this thing, a sheet of 15 or 20 things, and they know whether that dog likes or dislikes it because they've tried that dog on every one of right. those. Things. So my thing is always to limit the number of treats you're given. Mm -hmm. And so I, I have, and you know, we we're talking about three letters. My three letters are ABC. Uh, so I told people you can give the ABC treats. Well, what are the ABC treats? Okay, it's a triangle. Apple, bananas, beans of green. Uh, green beans are really easy. You get the uh, ones in a can that are kind of salty and stuff. Mm -hmm. Put them in a cupboard container. You know, a lot of dogs would eat carpet tacks out of the refrigerator, you know, but they'll they'll eat these as long as you keep them in the refrigerator and you get the green beans out. A lot of them like it. And get, get the ones that have salt in them because they like the salt. Then go to the bottom line, carrots, cucumbers, and cubes of ice. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm Dutch, and so cubes of ice are right in my price range. <laughs> so I love that. But And if you just follow those instructions, a uh, food with no beef, no milk, no wheat. And and, and you're right. They can be allergic to, to chicken. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think that chicken is a distant fourth on all of those things. Mm -hmm. They can be allergic to lamb, but I think that's right. a distant fifth. Uh, but, but so if you're allergic, to, here's, here's a question for you. If you if you think you have a dog with food allergies and it was allergic to chicken, would it be allergic to chicken fat? I don't know. Uh, maybe. I don't know. If there's the right answer. Uh, no, it can't be, because no? you're only going to be allergic to the protein fraction of anything. So that's why you don't see very many allergies to carrots and bananas and all this, and not much protein in there. Hmm. So it's almost always animal proteins. So okay. when you when you see a dog food that has four or five different proteins, well, it's got lamb and it says it has quail or something in there. You know, it's like all this crazy stuff now, ostrich, mm -hmm. kangaroo, all this thing. It's just protein. You could be allergic to any of those things. And mm -hmm. and really, it's not a histamine. You can't give antihistamines for food allergies. You have to usually use a steroid. And once you once you eat the wrong thing that you're allergic to, it's like poison ivy. You're You're messed up for probably two to three weeks. So sometimes people feed something, and in, in fact, there's always there are what they call type four allergic reactions. It takes about two days for them to show up. Like like you're out, you know, trimming your trimming your lawn up or something, and you get into poison ivy on Sunday. You don't mm -hmm. know until Tuesday, right? And that's, the way, that's the way food allergies are. Okay, and so kind of that systemic inflammation it will start to uh, increase or kind of show up over a few days or weeks. Well, then they dig at their ears and they make the annual you know, self mutilations. Remember what your mother told you about mosquito bites? If you keep if you keep itching them, 
they're going to get infected. And I've got about 20 of them right now. So yeah. that's uh, an, a very appropriate analogy. <laughs> she probably would have used real colorful language when she told you to knock it off. You know, yeah. like my mother did. You know, so I'm like, leave it alone. You know, but <laughs> that's what happens to dogs. It's the allergic reaction and then the self-mutilation by digging at the ears and rubbing the head and doing all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll give you a little tip when you see it in uh, so a lot of times ear infections will be in both ears at the same time. Sometimes it's only in one ear. And most of the time it's the right ear because the dogs dig at their ear with their prominent leg, which is usually, they're like us, they're more likely to be right-handed mm -hmm. uh, than ambidextrous. So okay. they're their right leg. And when we treat them, if we just treat the bad ear, the bad ear becomes the good ear and the good ear becomes the bad ear because mm -hmm. all this inflammation is going on. Yeah. That's interesting. I didn't really think of all of that, but I like the three letters. I think that's really easy for people to follow. Uh, ABC, and on, yeah. ABC, BMW. HL, yeah. Yep. Those are so easy. So last thing I kind of want to get into, and this one I know could be its own topic, but this idea of grain free. And I think people confuse grain free and gluten free. And I even think some of the dog food companies, I don't think it's purposeful, but their marketing can be confusing. You're like, is it grain free? Is it gluten free? Is it both? What are the pros and cons? And I know that you're pretty heavy on dogs need grain, but would you agree that dogs do not need gluten? They just need grains. Would you well, agree with that? Most of the grain contains gluten. So the, so the gluten is taken out of the grain, you know, so that's what, sometimes that's what they do. They take, you know, they have wheat gluten. Yes. That's the wheat protein. That's the protein right. fragment of the, of the wheat. And, and you're right. And, uh, and people get celiac disease. And so yep. three, they got two, two family members have celiac disease. So they see the commercial on TV. And by the way, uh, I would completely disagree with, you You know, I told you I wouldn't use the word always or never. Uh, you should okay. never think that they're I hate doing this to you, but you should okay. never think that they're not trying to fool you because they are trying to fool you. Right. Feed a grain free diet and people waltz in the exam room and go, hey, I'm feeding a grain free food. Isn't that great of me? And I'm like, no, that's not great of you. We're not going to name a street after you because you feed grain free diets. And, <laughs> and so we in fact, uh. I get this thing about while well, you're feeding, there's corn in your diet. Well, of course, there's corn in my diet. It has it has cysteine and methionine, which is a precursor for taurine. It, they're the, the amino acids used to make the, the the amino acid that is that gives you heart health and stuff. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so, yes, I'm I'm happy to have corn in there. I'm happy to have oats in there. I'm happy to have rice in there. Um, wheat, I'm a little neutral on because I think it contributes to a certain extent. You know, if I had to list them, beef, milk, and wheat, that's the way they show up. Mm -hmm. Beef is number one, milk is number two, you know. And and, and, my, and I see my clients all the time. Do you ever give your dog milk? No. How do you get, I'm giving you, send you pills out home. How are you going to get these down? Cheese. You know, and so, well, is yeah. that made out of home? Yeah. Wait a minute. Yeah, you're right. That is made out of, cheese is made out of milk, isn't it? And right. So you have to make them think all this stuff out and everything. And yeah, but I already told you, what are we selling in our place? Information, peace of mind. That's what we sell. And, uh, and, uh, and if you were my client, um, I would spend almost all my time trying to teach you uh, a new parlor trick, you know, for, <laughs> for your four dogs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, we appreciate all of the information that you've shared. Uh, last little piece, tell everyone where they can find you online, social media and website. Okay. Um, well, my my daughter probably have to give you all the details, but it's Voyager Dog Food Co. Or you can or you can find us at safedogfood.com. And and believe me, I can't even understand how recently we got that that we were we got the URL. Why would somebody not have that URL? Safedogfood.com. That's, <laughs> that's where you can find us. It'll take you to the website or Voyager Dog Food Co. Uh, and uh, and we're re I mean we're really proud of what we're doing and. Uh, uh, we have a really good team here. I still practice, so really, I'm not run. I'm doing some of the day to day stuff, but for the most part, I'm going down and staying relevant, so I can have these kind of conversations with you and your folks. So, so you're just a little bit busy. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little bit busy. You know, and that's what I should be in some beach in Barbados or something. But you know, I, I did that a little bit when I was younger, and it doesn't hold the. Um, you know, it just doesn't seem like it's as much fun now. But I. I like doing what I like doing. Uh, when, when you get a little older and, and probably maybe even some of your listeners will uh, find the same thing true as it, you know, you want to do the things you want to do. 
Right. And so I like doing this. And uh, we didn't even talk about environmental allergies or fleas or anything, but maybe at a later point in time, if people have questions, we can we can revisit some of the things. It doesn't have to be about dog food, but but this uh, you got to look up look up uh, copper storage disease, and uh, you'll you'll see a lot of stuff out there about it. And uh, clients would be well advised to uh, figure that out for themselves if they can. Right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Pete. It was a lot of fun today. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to the Canine Culture Podcast. Please make sure you subscribe to the Canine Culture Podcast on your favorite podcast platform and make sure you're following us on social media. If you have any recommendations, any topics that you'd like to hear, if you know of any guests that would be good for the show, or if you yourself want to be a guest, please reach out to us. Send us an email at canineculturepodcast at gmail.com or send us a direct message on social media. Thank you for listening and please share this with any of your dog loving friends.